Good morning, it's somewhere, and welcome back to the Consolation 2020 Green Room. Joining us once again, Randy Ask Me About My Music Video Dawn and Jeff Whistler Gomez. Hey guys, welcome aboard. Um, so so we, we, we could chat about your letters from Cleo video, Randy. All right. <laughs> I was like, which music video are we talking about here? I'm confused. How many have you been in? Uh, well, I've only really, I think I've only, well, I've made some for my own, my own benefit and amusement, yeah. but uh, I was only in that one, uh, but I worked for a music video firm in London in the early 90s. So I was sort of behind the scenes yeah. for a couple of different videos. The only one you may have ever heard of is the Sunday's Here's Where the Story Ends. Oh, that was, that's a great song. They were a great band for sure yes uh the 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 music video in which you are a tarot card reader randy okay. is the is the whitest video i have ever seen <laughs> oh, white is so it is really really white, oh, very white yes well it was boston you know boston in the 90s there were no black people around what do you that mean? is true that is true <laughs> uh yeah I, I actually didn't know how to read tarot cards but um they said we need people to do x y and z and i said well i could I have Stevie Nicks typed clothes. I could wear that sort of thing and I could get a deck of cards. And what was amazing is between the takes, people would come over and ask me to do readings. And I'm like, you know, I don't like have special skill. Oh no, please do readings. <laughs> it was amazing. People were like, that's so true. It's amazing. And I'm like, okay, we all read into what we all read into this, what we want to say. My mom used to do a, a palm reader bit for kids for she would read their palms, but what she was really doing was looking and saying, oh, their fingernails are kind of ragged. You play outdoors a lot. You know, <laughs> things like that, yeah. <laughs> the cold it, reading. The yes, cold it, reading. It, it, there's a lot you can pick up from body language, from oh, little sure. hints and clues and ticks like that. And yeah. that gets fascinating. Yeah, uh, I, I want to believe in that kind of stuff. I mean, I do write fantasy, but I just my, my experience has not borne out that there's much to it other than what we bring to it. Very good. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about, we kind of touched a little bit on, on the way people construct universes last time. I really would like to talk a little bit about shared universes, um, literally everything from like Robert Asprin's Thieves World, which is one of the earlier ones, uh, Blood of Ten Chiefs, when Wendy and Richard Pini opened up the elves to other writers, uh, all the way up to things like the MCU, which is the, the 800 pound gorilla example nowadays. Um, let's talk a little bit about what you guys think about it, experiences, anything you've played with in that area? Uh, played with in what way? It, have you participated in any shared experiences like that where you've worked with other authors in their playground? I, I have not. Uh, Jeff, have you done anything in that area? Let me count the ways. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the, the gaps. <laughs> Well, I mean, um, uh, some of the most impressive uh, uh, examples of that uh, were coming into formation in the 60s and 70s when I was a child, and those were the, um, uh, the Marvel and DC uh, superhero universes, where uh, there was a, a kind of singular cosmology, and many different writers and artists were contributing sub-stories or sub-series within this, these, these greater universes. Um, the, the, uh, the, there was an exquisiteness to, to looking at the footnotes in Spider-Man, uh, which referred to something that happened in Iron Man um, and, uh, and was somehow contiguous with the story that I was reading. I didn't read that Spider-Man book, uh, that Iron Man book. I, I'd better go out and buy it because I want to know how, how this is all uh, uh, connected. Um, uh, I saw a lot of this in, in uh, a Japanese popular culture, Japanese anime. There, uh, in, in the 60s and 70s, certain um, uh, animation artists and, and comic manga artists um, uh, set their characters and, and uh, storylines within the same kind of cosmology. They often didn't uh, uh, cross over into one another's stories, but somehow they, you, you kind of knew that the that Captain Harlock was out there somewhere in the universe of Galaxy Express 999. Um, uh, 
uh, I don't know how clear this is, Chuck, but you and I used to play Dungeons and Dragons at Queens College. <laughs> and um, it didn't take long uh, after I showed up uh, that the games uh, occasionally featured uh, uh, guest appearances from characters from other games um, uh, in, in one another's games. So as a creative collective, even though the games were very disparate and, and uh, even set in different genres, occasionally there'd be this kind of um, uh, uh, multi-dimensional crossover uh, uh, between uh, uh, characters. And, um, and so we were tickled to see Robert Asprin do this with Thieves World, where, where he, he set this universe up in stories or, or novels and then invited his fellow writers authors, uh, all professional authors, uh, to write uh, books set in this, uh, in this universe. We loved that stuff, didn't we, Chuck? Oh, it was huge. And, and I, I, I do remember a storyline where you guys kind of pushed a baby through a portal so that you could pull him back time skipped later. Uh <laughs> <laughs> of course. <Yes. laughs> I, would actually, I, mean, I don't want to interrupt here. I do have another a thing I can contribute to this, but please finish with your, with your thoughts. Well, I mean, after um, uh, 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 Thieves World, we started to see this uh, uh, more and more commonly. There was uh, George R. R. Martin's Wild Cards uh, uh, series. Um, uh, these were literary uh, uh, kind of shared universe uh, efforts. And then, um, uh, as we entered the 90s, the notion of, of uh, a transmedia uh, universe, multi-platform uh, universes where various uh, creators from different media even uh, were, were contributing toward the building of a, uh, a, a fantastical universe, that started to become uh, more and more common. And that, that's where, uh, the inspiration for things like uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and, and the DC Extended Universe kind of came from. Uh, we, we saw it in Buffy, uh, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel and, and the, the various spin-offs and tie-ins across media there. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Randy. No, that's quite all right. Um, mine is a little bit of a tangent, but I do think there is a, a Venn diagram overlap with these audiences that are interested. So I, um, I'm a big Law and Order fan, and um, I, the, my, some, some of the, a lot of the fiction that I was doing for a period of time was fan fiction. So I was writing fan fiction within that universe, and I knew a lot of other people who were also writing it in that universe. And this was before there was an SVU, before there was a criminal intent, before that universe really expanded. But you know, my job is I cover television, but I was really into this show and so I was writing fiction about it. And then all of a sudden, the creators of that show started expanding their universe. There was used to be another show on called Homicide Life on the Streets, which is a terrific show. If you can find it, you've got time in quarantine, go for it. Um, but what happened was the creators of those, show, those two shows, Tom Fontana was one of the showrunners on, on Homicide and Dick Wolf is the creator of the Law and Order universe. They were buds. And um, they said, let's cross over our, our shows, which was really not being done on TV at the time. Um, and so you, there, were, there were at least three different crossovers between those two shows. And that was an interesting to me blending of those universes, which once SVU became a TV series, uh, the character John Munch, who had been a detective on Homicide, ended up becoming a character on SVU. And that was, that was, I don't think there's a whole lot of that where a character created on one show by somebody else entirely migrates to another show once that first show goes away. He also showed up um, on X-Files, if I recall. He and did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lone Gunman. Yeah. He was on Lone Gunman, yeah, because he's, he's yeah. like a conspiracy, you know, fam back, back when conspiracy nuts were amusing. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, he was like the proto-conspiracy guy on these shows. And um, so... I ended up really getting into that particular shared universe. And it was fun because it just felt like it, it, it expanded your mind in terms of, oh, well, wait a minute, these people meet. What's the, what is it like when they hang out together? How are these characters bouncing off of one another? And it just gave you a bigger picture into the world. And just for a quick plug, I don't know if you can see it behind me, but right there, this is the Law and Order SVU Unofficial Companion. 
sure. and I'm a co-author on that. We cover the first like 10 seasons. So if you're a fan, <laughs> grab it. Uh, anyway, so that that's that is my experience with Law and Order and SVU, and I'm still I'm still fascinated by the characters that they created. And one of the great things about that particular show is they didn't do a whole lot of backstory. You had SVU has done a lot of backstory now, but the original recipe show did not have a lot of backstory, which gave you a huge playground to play in if you were going to be writing fan fiction. So since you pointed to your bookshelf back there, there's also a book facing toward us, which is kind of the reverse of that theory. Yes, this is the, the uh, Cross the Universe book, where the idea was for each author to take the characters in wildly different directions that made it a very non-shared universe. And of course, the shared universe in Cross the Universe are the Beatles. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Charles created a story that is in that book and I was the co-editor and yeah that's another way to expand the universe um, is to look at the look at the people in it and what other stories can you tell about them what more fantastical stories can you tell that were not necessarily about the real people but about the characters we created for them so I'm going to kind of segue from that into the idea of, of working with multiple creatives. And, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about some of your experience uh, professionally, personally in interacting with other creative people and how that's helped you do the work that you do and how you've helped them do the work they do and kind of talk about those points of connectivity. Sure. You want to go first there, Jeff? Because I've been... Go for it. Oh. <laughs> um... Well, um, uh, I've encountered um, uh, two kinds of, of creators, uh, w one of whom I get a lot more work with. <laughs> um, there's the kind of creator who um, uh, understands or, or has created their universe in hopes that, that the world um, would be larger than, than the author, the original uh, visionary. Uh, and that the world would persist uh, creatively and expand continually uh, beyond that, that the limitations of that creator's uh, talent or career or even lifespan. Um, uh, uh, and, um, and there's nothing wrong with the opposite. It's just that those uh, uh, story worlds tend to persist um, uh, and, um, and proliferate and can become kind of blockbuster um, uh, things that transcend time, these, these properties. There are other creators that I've encountered uh, like uh, uh, J.K. Rowling um, and Stephanie Meyer, the Twilight uh, novels, who um, uh, disagree with that approach, who say, you know what, I'm the, the visionary, uh, the, the characters and, and storylines are, are not real if, if I'm not uh, uh, writing them, and so the buck stops with me. And, um, uh, and that kind of locks out the uh, contribution of, of other uh, creators and, uh, and prevents a, a kind of vast expansion of, of, the, of the narrative universe. Um, uh, what, what happens in, in, the, in those two cases from my personal uh, uh, standpoint, I, because I, I've uh, encountered uh, Rowling and Meyer, um, is that um, uh, there are enormous forces at play which want those universes to expand and persist uh, because they generate many, many millions of dollars. Um, uh, whole movie studios are, are dependent on, on the success of these, uh, these story worlds. Uh, uh, theme parks and, and, uh, and publishers, book publishers, would like for a lot more Twilight um, or, or Harry Potter. Um, uh, uh, so, um, I, I, would, I would come in offering recommendations for how they can do this and yet maintain the integrity of the universe. That seemed to be the primary concern. Um, in, in both of those cases, the answer was no. <laughs> um, I, I'm the author. Uh, it, it, um, it is only going to be me who expands these uh, uh, worlds, perhaps me in collaboration with a playwright so we can get Harry Potter, the cursed child. Um, but that's it. And, um, and that's, that's fine, but, um, but at a certain point I have to leave because I, I can't help the studio expand the universe when, when the visionary is not cooperative. 
Yeah. The, the, the phrase I'm thinking of is Larry Niven used to use the phrase good use of playground equipment to describe an author respectfully working with another author's property. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, it, it is, Don't break my toys. <laughs> it's, my, it's my experience that in science fiction and fantasy, um, this is kind of baked in in a lot of ways uh, in terms of people co-opting other people's uh, universes or stories. And sometimes it's, it's approved and sometimes it's not approved. I was talking a minute ago about fanfic and um, that just kind of, I remember when I was, when I was writing it, there was really this sort of, people looked down on it quite a lot. Like, oh, you know, you obviously can't write your own character. So you're just taking somebody else's. And I remember going back and looking up ways to defend the, the doing of this, because obviously it was done in the movies. We just talked about the superhero aspect of it and the comic book aspect of it. And if I may, uh, I came across a quote at that time from Harlan Ellison um, in uh, his, his book, Dangerous Visions, which is an anthology. Um, he actually didn't call, he didn't call this fanfic. He called it literary feedback when you, when you ripped on somebody else's <laughs> I love it. story. Uh, and if I may quote from him, this is, a, this is a quote that I had saved and I'm just gonna read it aloud. Uh, he's prefacing um, a, a story uh, that he cribbed from uh, Robert Block. Um, and he got lots of praise for it, but basically his original inspiration was Block's story. And he said, uh, every writer save the meanest hack hopes his words will live after he goes down the hole, that his thoughts will influence people. It isn't the primary purpose of the writing, of course, but it's the sort of secret wish that parallels the average man having babies, so his name doesn't die with him. And here in my hands, Ellison had just been handed this German story that was inspired by one of his own tales, was the visible proof that something in my mind had conjured up, had reached out and ensnared another man's imagination. It was obviously the, the sincerest form of flattery and by no means plagiarism. It was the literary feedback. Uh, the instances of this action reaction among writers are numberless and some of them are legend. It is the reason for writers seminars, workshops, conferences, and the endless exchange of letters among writers. So anyway, I kind of like that concept of literary feedback. Clearly you can't just take some of these characters and start making money off of them because the, the originator deserves that credit. But I love the idea that there's this give and take and expanding of universes and, and sharing of minds and that the, the concept becomes bigger than the originator at some point. I mean, we know who created Superman. That, that's something we're always gonna know. But the idea that Superman lives 100 years after the original story first, stories first came out is, is pretty incredible. And that makes the story and the idea bigger than the creator, which I think is great. And the more you cling really tightly to no one else may touch my sacred object, I think the more quickly you're likely to resign yourself to obscurity. You know, you may have that, that one item to yourself and you may be the only person who can say that they wrote about it, but you just get smaller and smaller in, in, the, in the vast reaches of time as time goes on. I, when you're talking about defending fan fiction, and, and I, I, I've been one of the people who's hated on it probably more than I should. Uh, <laughs> I was in a conversation with a, a, a college professor who teaches writing about science fiction. And what I realized had turned her off to science fiction wasn't science fiction, it was lazy writing. Mm. And one of the problems a lot of people have with fan fiction is literally people who can't create their own characters or their own settings and are simply saying, this is taking place in Star Trek, so I don't have to describe uniforms or hallways. You know, I, I can glom onto the visuals and skip the world building. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what makes good fan fiction work, what makes good fiction work in general, is the people who don't skip the world building. That, that, yeah, I, I, you know. I think there's a lot of people who take that and learn from that. You know, it's like, these are the mm -hmm. building blocks that I'm going to learn from, and then they expand from that. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying that I'm a huge fan of fanfic. I actually really don't read a lot of it, but it sort of helped give me confidence and gave me an audience early on that I felt confident to share my writing. So that when I moved into writing my own stuff, I felt more confident to share it with people in my community, which I know we're talking about in terms of people who help you with the writing. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to get into that. So I know, for example, Randy, you're involved with Broad Universe. Right. So you want to uh, so, talk about those kind of connections? 
Sure. So for those who, who don't know what Broad Universe is, very briefly, it's a, um, it's a networking organization of uh, female and female identifying writers, um, generally of spec fic, science fiction, fantasy horror, but not exclusively. Uh, if you go to broaduniverse.org, a lot more information there, a lot more specifics. Um, you know, uh, men and male identifying can certainly be members, but we, the idea is to sort of uh, elevate the voices of female and female identifying writers. And um, we, it, it's really been great because there's a small membership fee, but you have access to all of these writers of varying levels in the industry who've published independently, who've published with major publishers, who've published themselves. And you can see how they've done it and you can get that advice and get that marketing information and really learn how to build your own career. And then at conventions, we do short readings. We call them rapid fire readings where you get you know anywhere between five and 10 minutes and there's about eight or nine readers in the course of an hour. We, I think of it as like a, 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 a tasting platter. <laughs> you know, It's like you can see many writers in one reading. Um, and that's been really helpful because again, even if you don't sell a book, through that, you get more confidence in reading in front of people and you're not obligated to read for a half an hour or an hour. And you know that you'll get some readers because the other authors in the room will come and listen to, they'll be there to listen to them. Uh, and I've made really good friends through this too. I mean, you know, friends who are writers, we've, we've gotten together independently and we have, um, you know, we've had our own little mini writing seminars, our writing getaways. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of automatic community and you bring to it what you wanna to bring to it and you take away from it what you can take away from it. And it really has just been so invaluable for, for me. And I think a lot of other writers to get that next leg up because when I first started writing, I didn't know anybody really who was also writing. And a lot of the people I met who were writing were quote unquote, super serious literary authors, which was really kind of not where I was going. And finding those like minds to be able to share your fiction with or share your stories with is, is critical to really get a sense of how you're doing, what you need to improve, and just feeling more confident in being able to share it with the universe. You know, you can write as long as you want and sit in your room and stare at it, but if you actually want to share it with people, you need to have the confidence to be able to do that. So um, Broad Universe is terrific. It's not, it's, it's, I'm sure it's not the only organization out there, but it's, it's one of the best that I know. And so, Jeff, more on the professional side, do you want to talk about how Starlight Runner was built to, to support the kind of things that are being done creatively? Well, sure. I mean, um, uh, to, to, to drill down just a little bit, the, um, um, uh, the, I, I came from a, a place and, and a space where uh, no one was a writer. And, um, and so uh, because I, I wrote halfway decently, uh, at least in school, my writing was recognized. So, so I had all these teachers telling me how fantastic I was, and um, uh, and that uh, that I could grow up to become a writer. And mm -hmm. um, and so that egocentrism and 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 that uh, 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 that confidence uh, took me forward um, uh, in isolation until one day I, I got into uh, uh, Stuyvesant High School and realized that there were writers my age who were a lot better than me. <laughs> um, and getting to sit down and, and talk with them and, uh, and ask them about these techniques and, um, and, and look at the, their, their little uh, uh, fanfic, you know, and, and how they were able to uh, 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 to write about established characters and things like that were uh, at the time beyond my, my comprehension. That really um, uh, uh, kind of started setting into my mind um, uh, the, the fact that, that, uh, um, uh, that community um, and, um, and the sharing of personal experiences uh, can create uh, a, a great leaps forward just as much as reading Writer's Digest magazine, or or trying to take apart Stephen King or or Tolkien's work and figure out how they did that uh, all by myself. Um, uh, th that sense of community was the um, uh, 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 the 
the impetus for my uh, moving forward into a career in gaming, um, uh, working at Gateways Magazine, uh, and, and then uh, uh, writing games and video games at Acclaim Entertainment, and uh, ultimately in, in forming my own company, Starlight Runner, in, in 2000, uh, pulling uh, uh, people who I knew from the industry, um, uh, who, whose work I respected, uh, to, to come in and help me kind of figure out this new modality of storytelling, this transmedia storytelling. So you, you've actually got a fairly interesting team there. Do you want to mention a few people? We'll shout out. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, my first uh, uh, partner in Starlight Runner is Mark Pensavalli. He comes from publishing. He was a production manager in a publisher. Uh, and and uh, uh, part of being becoming successful is knowing what your limitations are. <laughs> and, and mine were a sense of <clears throat> production organization, disciplining the team to get them to get things done. Um, and um, uh, 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 the nuts and bolts of, of getting it done. My, my head was in the clouds. Also, sometimes my storytelling was in the clouds. So if Mark uh, looked at my storytelling and said, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm I'm Joe Average. I, I go to the movies. I, I watch Star Wars. This is this is a little much, dude. Um, uh, so so I can adjust my thinking uh, so that my audience uh, can be abroad and popular. Um, uh, Fabian Nicieza uh, was my boss at Acclaim uh, Comics. Uh, he was the editor in chief and, and publisher of Acclaim Comics, but he also had created Deadpool um, and had written X-Men comics and New Warriors comics and had, uh, had sold uh, like a hundred million copies of, of his comic books. Um, I, I think he was drawn to, um, uh, to me and to, uh, to the notion of transmedia storytelling uh, because he wanted to expand his horizons. Here was someone who had tremendous expertise, a best-selling comic book writer, uh, better than me uh, on, on many levels. Um, uh, why did I want him in my company? He would overshadow me. He would be, uh, you know, um, uh, dominating the conversation. Well, um, I needed uh, uh, someone as good, uh, if not better than me, uh, to do this writing and, and to, uh, to help me understand the entertainment industry and, uh, and so forth. Uh, a little bit of that Abraham Lincoln team of rivals, uh, a, a sort of thing, where where we're on the bridge of the enterprise having an argument about that space anomaly, <laughs> so that so that our our conflicting perspectives can be uh, reconciled and um, <clears throat> and made into a stratagem uh, for success. Um, uh, so so Fabian was great that way. Sometimes. We irritated the hell out of each other, but you know, um, <laughs> there's uh, Chrysula Artemis, a graphic designer, uh, helping helping to shore up um, uh, what we were talking about from a visual uh, standpoint. There's Steel Philippec, um, uh, someone who knew how, who basically knows everything, um, uh, can create the historic context for it or the structural uh, context for what it was that we were doing. And he provides that kind of, of support uh, with elegance and, and supreme confidence. Uh, so, you know, you assemble uh, a, a team that didn't ne necessarily have to agree with each other all the time, but was the best at what it is that, that they did. And, um, and that really en enabled us to walk into Hollywood, which is the ultimate intimidating high school environment. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and tell them, listen, this isn't our opinion. These are facts. <laughs> the facts are these. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and lay them out and be right. And, and that earned us the money, uh, that earned us the respect uh, uh, to be able to interact with um, uh, Avatar and Pirates of the Caribbean and Spider-Man and Men in Black. Yeah. 
the, the, the team aspect is a very important thing and I'm glad you guys were able to talk about it from two different perspectives there. Um, want to kind of transition a little bit into the modern world because you were talking about that idea of building consensus of disparate opinions being able to come together, which is a thing we've gotten very bad at recently as a country. Mm -hmm. You guys want to talk a little bit about where you see things going toward or ever fixing any of that? Uh, yeah, I feel like that's a whole, that, that ends up being a whole political conversation, which I'm sure we're not planning on getting into, yeah. but, you know, it strikes me that there's really, a, there's a bunch of different ways to look at it, and there's two, there are at least two dominating way, approaches uh, in this country at this time, one of which is uh, we have to work together in order to come to solution, and another one of which is I figured this out for myself, you need to figure it out for yourself. And I don't think either one of those are entirely invalid, but if those are your only two ways of looking at things, you know, you need to be able to blend both of those things. I think that the US zeitgeist is very much a, an independent thing. You know, we, we, you know, you go out into the West, you, you forge your own path, you carve out your own, and it's very individualistic. And, um, but I think that the way society especially in societies that are as diverse and growing and large as ours. I mean, we don't live all by ourselves on a plot of land in the middle of Nebraska anymore. At least most of us don't. Um, the way that societies I think work best is when you can come together as a community and, um, and, and assist and help one another. And to sort of set yourself apart from the community and, and just say, well, you guys can work together if you want to, but I'm going to figure this out for myself. That just makes everybody else weaker. You know, it, it makes the group weaker. And I think that we need to revisit the whole idea of what it means to be, um, to help as a collective and to not be afraid of the idea that we all maybe need to contribute to a common goal or a common source of, uh, of wealth or um, resources, I guess is a better word for it, and not be afraid to say, I maybe need help, or I have more than I need, here's a little help for you. I think people start putting that stuff into easy categories and they start throwing around labels and people immediately shrink away from whatever those labels are. And I'm not gonna even say those labels because that's not where we're going with this. Um, but I do feel that we need to be able to have a better idea of what it means to be a community, you know, we talk a lot about being patriotic, being loyal. What are you loyal to? Are you loyal to yourself? Are you loyal to a bigger idea? You know, this is something we were actually talking about a little earlier. I've been thinking about it this way, but we talked about, you know, sharing your universe. You know, are you going to let your universe die with you because you need to hold really tight to it? Or at some point are you going to say, you know, this is a big idea. I'd like other people to share in it. And I think if we can take that concept and apply it to our everyday existence, you can look at yourself in the mirror and like yourself a bit better if you can do that. Um, you know, you may always get more of what you need every single second if it's only about you. You may miss out on a couple of things if you, if it, if you, if you have to share sometimes. But I think that we feel better about ourselves uh, as human beings when we know that we've helped other people in the process. And I'm going to run for your state senate. So vote for me. <laughs> yeah. Kind of sound like a stump speech at the very end there. No, no. It, 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 Randy. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say one of the things that I was listening to during the current election cycle was they, they were interviewing this woman and she said one of the problems is that neither party is talking to underage Hispanic people. <laughs> and the interviewer said, well, they don't vote. They're underage. And he was like, yeah, but they're the translators for all these families that don't speak English. <laughs> We're now excluded from the conversation entirely that if you can reach their 12-year-old, they will actually hear your message. If you don't reach their 12-year-old, the adults who can vote will never hear your message. And, and those kind of accidental or intentional exclusions are also part of the mechanism. Mm. That's a good point. But, I um Jeff, I know you've done a lot about how the narrative can be used, how storytelling can be used in a more governmental setting. Uh, right, right, and and that was an extremely uh, uh, perceptive observation, Chuck. Um, the um, 
uh, and everything Randy said uh, absolutely applies. Um, my, my company in between uh, the, the movie stuff and the video game stuff does uh, uh, geopolitical uh, consulting. Uh, we talk about uh, national and international narratives uh, with um, uh, governments, NGOs, uh, charities, and, and things like that. Um, uh, uh, something happened uh, fairly recently that was actually kind of encouraging for us. Uh, we hadn't worked for the United States government in um, three or four years. <laughs> um, and, um, and we were contacted uh, by the uh, State Department and they wanted us to talk with them. Th this is the State Department in formation. Um, uh, uh, to talk with them about um, uh, the, the national narrative and global narratives and, and, uh, and what can be done from a narrative perspective um, uh, to, um, uh, to move us uh, toward a, a, a spirit of, of fellowship, toward a, a, a spirit of, of reconciliation. And uh, I thought that was really interesting because uh, five or six years ago, uh, when I was expressing strong concern about uh, these narratives to the previous administration, the Obama administration, uh, uh, they really didn't know what I was talking about and, and, and didn't want to, to bother much with it. So I'm glad that there is uh, this understanding that story, which was used uh, uh, to Donald Trump's advantage over the past four years so much, um, it is something that is on the radar of the, of the next administration. Now, with regard to what to do about it, um, uh, it, it isn't a matter of taking sides and this isn't a conversation about the, the details, um, uh, but what uh, we will apply are the very same uh, value systems that are integrated into blockbuster global movies, uh, particularly aspirational films uh, like what you're seeing with Star Wars and, and uh, Avatar and, and, and so forth. There are underlying value systems in movies, um, in, in, the, in, in great movies, that, uh, that can be gleaned by anyone in the world and seen as aspirational. There is a, a set of fundamental underlying values that the human race generally embraces as something that will help to perpetuate us as a species um, and, and bring us some degree of happiness, some, some degree of, of, of uh, 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 satisfaction uh, out of life. Uh, what are they? And, um, and when, you, when you glean them, when you know what they are, um, uh, you can place them into uh, uh, stories and, um, and have people uh, gravitate toward them no matter where they are on the political uh, spectrum. And, um, and those are the elements that we would look for in, in, uh, in kind of uh, constructing a, a reconciliation uh, narrative. We'd also stop looking at the situation as a polarized uh, 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 system, good, evil, right, wrong, um, uh, rich, poor, uh, urban, rural, uh, and start seeing this as an interlocking networked system um, uh, that uh, the, the flash points of which or facet points of which can be represented by different characters and, and storylines so that um, uh, we can uh, think about different ways to tell the story that would allow for uh, reconciliation, systemic repair and, um, and result in in something more positive and aspirational for more people. Well, I think it's a terrific note to end on because we've got less than a minute left oh, before this is going to cut out. No, 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 no. That was phenomenal. I appreciate that a great deal, but uh, we need to get played out. Danny. <laughs> and with that, we've come back to the end of the show before the show that will never start. <laughs> Thank you.